Charles Darwin. He looks like a big Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin. Um, he's, he's traveling around on this boat. Do you know what the name of the boat was? Beagle. Beagle. The, the Beagle. And uh, there he is in an older age. And that's him too. And he's looking at all these things. He's a, uh, he's a naturalist, so he studies nature, someone who studies nature, a biology guy. And he's also, uh, he's also knows a lot about geology, because he has a friend uh, named uh, Lyle, who is a, wrote a bunch of geology books, and so he knows about fossils. And when he goes on these journeys, he knows how to hunt for fossils and find fossils. And uh, he gets all of this data, and he starts formulating in his mind that not only is it true that organisms change over time, but he comes up with the mechanism for how organisms change over time. Natural selection. It's called natural selection, that's right. Yeah. And natural selection has been called the greatest idea in the history of thought. It's a pretty, because all of a sudden, we have an explanation of how we came to be, which before this time was unknown. And so uh, that's probably why Charles Darwin's so famous. And it's really not that difficult to understand his explanation of natural selection, which I'll explain today. And uh, you, you kind of wonder, after you learn it, you kind of wonder, well, how come no one ever thought of that before? But um, <coughs> Darwin actually, a, another cool story that kind of goes along with this, Darwin did, wasn't the only one to come up with natural selection. Another guy named Alfred Russell Wallace also came up with natural selection <laughs> on his own at around the same time. Actually, Darwin got it first. But Darwin sat on the idea for a long time and didn't tell anybody. Alfred His name was Alfred Russell Wallace. Russell. Mm -hmm. Russell. And he, uh, Darwin was afraid to publish his idea because he was afraid of, of what people would say about him because it does go against a lot of the stuff that the church was saying. And so he was afraid not only that he'd be ridiculed, but he was afraid for his life. So, um, uh, but there were some other thinkers coming up with it, and Alfred Russell Wallace came up with this idea of natural selection, and he said, hey, this is a pretty good idea. I'll send it to the best naturalist I know of and see what he thinks about my idea. And so he sent his idea to Darwin. And so Darwin gets this idea in the mail that's his theory of natural selection that he's been working on for 30 years compounding all this evidence for it. Because Darwin said, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna say this to the world, I'm gonna be able to back it up with plenty of evidence. So he worked for like 30 years getting all this evidence for his theory of natural selection. And then he gets this thing in the mail from Wallace saying, I have this idea of natural selection. And Darwin's like, okay, I better publish now or I'm gonna lose credit for it. So Darwin published his idea. He published it along with Wallace, side by side. He sent both of them in to this council of scientists called the Linnaean Society, who's a council of scientists that publishes things. Peer review. And, right, a peer review type of group. And, uh, and so uh, Darwin gets the credit, and Wallace, you don't hear much about Wallace, but he was in on it too. That's in Creation, they talk about all this. Yeah, and this, this is a movie Isaac's talking about. It's called Creation. It's about Charles Darwin. I'm watching it right now, and I'm making out the quiz, and I'll have it here for extra credit. Yeah? What did you say he sent it to? The Linnaean Society is the name of the, of the group of scientists. So here's a little uh, video, just about two minutes, about Darwin's voyages in life. The Industrial Revolution was just beginning. In Britain, it seemed, all the world was opening to these engines of change. It was a time of big ideas and big men. There was Erasmus Darwin, a prosperous country physician, 
a published poet, a free thinker, and a champion of the new technology. His son, Robert, another man of influence and girth, followed him into medicine when Robert's second son was born, February 12, 1809. It was assumed he would be part of a third generation of country physicians. But Charles Robert Darwin was happier in the woods than the classroom. He preferred to be outdoors, hunting, bird watching, collecting, exploring. Charles was in and out of uh, country houses and barnyards, um, and he saw how people selected the best cattle and the best pigs and the best horses and bred from them uh, to improve the quality of the stock. Later on, Charles would call this artificial selection. Uh, his own mother kept fancy pigeons, so Charles could see right at home that from a common rock pigeon, the kind you find in Trafalgar Square in England, you get all kinds of extraordinary breeds, Jacobins and Pouters and nuns and like. He abandoned his medical studies and wound up at Cambridge University, where he was to study for the ministry. And that's when it first uh, occurred to him that he could make his name in natural science. He could make better beetle collections than any of the beetle collectors. He came here to the River Cairn and scouted along the banks and looked at the trees and pulled beetles out of the bark. Uh, he bested a lot of them. Knowing full well that he was more interested in collecting bugs than saving souls, two of his professors recommended him for a voyage around the world. The refitted 90-foot warship named Beagle was to map the South American coast. It was the turning point in Darwin's life. Intended to last two years, it was five years before the Beagle returned. Five years of collecting, observing, exploring, and writing. The most important stop for Darwin was the Galapagos Islands. This relatively young, isolated archipelago 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador was a naturalist dream, a laboratory of evolution. In a feverishly busy five weeks, he followed seagoing iguanas and tracked tortoises that seemed to vary from island to island. He collected 13 different types of birds that all turned out to be finches and three species of mockingbirds. The animals must have come to the islands from South America in the distant past, but these creatures varied remarkably from their mainland ancestors. Darwin was amazing. He was 27 years old when he got off the Beagle. Uh, his notebooks were, were, were bulging with data about uh, all the places he had visited. Uh, he had enormous collections. In addition to adding to his Beagle collection, he gathered 1,500 species preserved in alcohol, 4,000 skins, bones, and dried specimens, crates and crates of fossils, he returned with 3,000 pages of notes on entomology, geology, paleontology, and zoology. He was the toast of London's scientific community. Even his father was finally impressed. Okay, so here's how Darwin's theory of natural selection works. Um, and he used, uh, one of the things he tried to explain using his theory of natural selection is kind of a good, uh, example, is the, uh, the, the long necks of giraffes. And what Darwin's theory said is that early giraffes probably had short necks. Oh, I'm sorry, wait, this isn't Darwin's theory, this is Lamarck's theory. Um, this is Lamarck's theory of what he called acquired characteristics. Uh, the book talks about some of the thinking at the time, and one of the ideas of how evolution works is <coughs> called acquired characteristics. So this guy, uh, his name was Lamarck. He said that maybe what happened was giraffes would stretch their necks over their life to try and get food. And they'd stretch and stretch. And the stretching of their necks to try and get food made their necks a little longer. And then when they had baby giraffes, the babies were born with necks that were a little longer. It doesn't work now. And, and, and that was the idea. That's what's called acquired characteristics. And so over many generations, the necks get longer and longer. 
and uh, because of the stretching to reach the food. And, and that's really not what happens, but it was a good guess. I mean, maybe it could have happened, but it doesn't. It'd be like saying that if you wear braces and straighten up your teeth over your lifetime, then you'll have kids with straighter teeth. And that's not how it works. You, your genes determine the shape of your teeth, and it doesn't matter what you do to them over your lifetime, you're going to pass your genes for crooked teeth on to your kids if you have crooked teeth. So acquired characteristics wasn't right, but that was one of the ideas floating around at the time. Darwin's idea, natural selection worked like this. Here we have a bunch of giraffes. And the first thing Darwin noticed about organisms was that there is variation. Variation is an important part of natural selection. So if you look at a, any group of organisms, you'll find variation in the organisms. Ancient giraffes some of them probably had longer necks. Some of them probably had shorter necks, just like humans. Some humans have longer necks than others, right? Some humans are tall. Some humans are short. In any population, there's variation, and that's one thing Darwin knows. Another thing that was important to Darwin was the, what he called the cruelty of nature. The fact that there are more organisms born than end up surviving to adulthood. <coughs> Darwin said, for instance, a fish might lay a thousand eggs, but only a couple of those survive to be adults. So obviously 998 of them are dying. So this idea is called overproduction. Yes, overproduction. There's an overproduction of offspring. So yes. the, um, the animals that make all the offspring, they, they do it just to have variation? No, they do it uh, for survival purposes. If you have a bunch of them, there's a chance that there's a I mean, chance there, that one of them will survive to adulthood like why, or some of them. Why is there such a high mortality rate in them, but like for a chicken, it's like several of them will, like a good portion of those that are born will live to adulthood? Because we're protecting the chickens. Because the farmers keep the wolves from eating the chickens. Oh, yeah. If it were really out there in nature, chicken would lay a bunch of eggs, you'd have a bunch of baby chickens, and they'd get picked off by other organisms and eaten, and you'd only end up with a few surviving to adulthood. Yeah. But not quite as much as, like, fish. Well, that's true. Some organisms produce more young than, than mm -hmm. others. And there's, there's different ways to go about, um, mm -hmm. to go about life. There's, there's two real strategies we see. One strategy is have a, just a few babies and spend your energy protecting the babies. The other strategy is instead spend your energy having as many babies as possible and don't protect any of them. There's only so much energy you have. So you can spend it having thousands of babies and just hope one makes it, some make it to adulthood because there's so many. Or just have a few babies like we do and protect them and try to ensure that they make it to adulthood that way. And both strategies work. But either way, there is an overproduction. Not every child makes it to adulthood, and you especially see that in nature. And so here we have a variety of different size necks. That's the variation. And we have an overproduction. So some of them will die, and I put X's by the ones that will die. Now, I've put X's by ones with shorter necks. And why have I done that? They can't, they can't, they can't get the food. Well, in, in this particular place where giraffes evolved, there's not much food on the ground. And it's kind of a bad picture I've chosen here because there's grass all over the ground in that picture. And why not just lean down and eat the grass? But let's pretend it's in an area where there's not much grass and most of the, most of the food are leaves on a tree. Well, then they'd have to eat food that's high up, and ones born with shorter necks wouldn't be as good at that. So they wouldn't get as much food, and they end up dying out. It doesn't look like a longer neck one would be really be able to reach it either. Well, 
Yeah, pictures. because my, my picture's pretty lame. <laughs> but even but let's just pretend that the longer neck ones are, are higher right. up. And so, this was called, uh, this is called differential survival, or some other people have called it survival of the fittest. But Darwin never used that term. This third part of this. <coughs> organisms that have a survival advantage tend to live, and organisms that don't have the advantage tend to die out over time. So the short neck ones die out. <coughs> the long neck ones are left. <coughs> they mate with one another and have kids. And then the next generation is, has variation too. But for the most part, they've got a little bit longer necks than the generation before them, if you consider everybody in the generation before them. Some, there are still some born with short necks because of variation. But they end up dying too. <coughs> and we can just continue this, generation after generation. And after many thousands of generations, I'm trying to do it in three here to illustrate the point, but after many thousands of generations, you find if you were to measure the necks each year, the necks of, or of the giraffes thousands of generations later would be slightly longer than the necks of giraffes thousands of generations before <coughs> due to these three factors. And so if you compare a later generation, the neck length, to earlier generations, we've had a change over time. And that's natural selection. And what we call that is, hold on, these three things lead to what we call adaptation. Adaptation is being is being fit, fit in where your body form is fit to the area where you're living. <coughs> and so you're well adapted to that area because your body has, because the body of you, your species has changed over time to fit the particular area. Yes, Stephanie? Yeah, good enough. So this is basically, these four points are basically Darwin's idea. And he, and if you go through his book and read his book, The Origin of Species, he talks, talks about variation. It shows all these different populations and measurements and math and stuff showing the variation of organisms. And how many more, for every population he studies, there are more born than survive. And how, if you have, if you have properties that allow you to survive over your brothers and sisters, um, then that will lead to a change in the organism over time because you'll pass your genes on, and your brothers and sisters that didn't have the weren't born with the adaptations weren't, weren't born with the variations that are, make you fit to survive, they, they die out and don't have any kids. Question? Did you say that the adaptations were for the gene mutations and those that don't get it, that's why they just become extinct? Mutations are one way that you get some variation. But there's three other ways we studied where variation comes about. Do y'all remember the different ways we get variation? Putting the Crossing over. Uh, Crossing over. Independent assortment. Fertilization. fertilization. Sex. Yeah. All lead to variation. So we know now how the variation comes about. Darwin didn't really know about Mendelian genetics. So Darwin didn't really know how the variation comes about. He hypothesized that there's something going on in the shuffling of genes 
uh, that led to variation, but he didn't know what it was. Mendel showed us what it was. How many, oh, long time later was it? How many what? <laughs> Did Darwin? Uh, no, there were. Uh, uh, Darwin was basically from 1830 to 1860 was when Darwin was doing his work, and Mendel, if I'm not mistaken, was about the the same time. But Darwin didn't know about Mendel's work. Remember, Mendel's work kind of got discovered later, after Mendel died. So Mendel was never famous for his work while he was alive. They didn't have like the internet and ways to spread information quickly back then. So Mendel did his work and showed it to some people and kind of just kind of took a while for everybody to, to see it. Are there ever short neck dress melodies? Well, these guys, when they mate with one another, they'll have a litter of giraffes, and some of them will have shorter necks than their parents, and some of them will have longer necks than their parents. But all their necks look long to us. There's not any born with real short necks anymore. Because that neck, over thousands of years, gets longer and longer. And the variations in one generation are just a little bit compared to the so full size of the neck. Mm -hmm. It depends. Um, the trees, while the, it's interesting, while the giraffes get taller necks, the trees actually evolve to grow taller too, to escape being eaten by the giraffes, you see. So we call this co-evolution, and uh, it could continue, yeah, organisms are still evolving. And so the giraffes might have even longer necks, and the trees might be even taller. Is it, like, didn't people kind of have a really feel taller? People have gotten taller, too, but one of the reasons why people have gotten so much taller is, is, is due to diet, better diet, and better health, and more food. And that's not really as much in the genes as it is in the environment. The environment has a big effect, too. And so people have grown about a foot in the last 100 years. That's not a genetic change. Genetic changes are much slower. Um, it, that's an environmental change. If, if people 100 years had had our um, diets and as much food as we have and as much exercise as we get and that sort of thing, they'd have been a, a lot taller, too. How come they Well, I was actually wondering if they, they do. They do. Like so many people have asked me before, well, how do the baby giraffes get food? Well, they they eat off the mother. You know, they drink the mother's milk and so. And then once they get a certain age, they they aren't cared for anymore. They aren't like people where they feel sorry for this giraffe, so they're going to give them some food. They're trying to survive. Everyone's just out there trying to survive. So you get as much food as you can to ensure you survive. And uh, your buddy is on his own. So they would never like at least like. Nah, they don't share and not, not like not like we do. Yeah. What if they were like placed in a area that had like all the food on the ground over like thousands of years? Would they be evolved? Yeah, they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, short ones might be favored. As a matter of fact, there's there's some islands that they found with miniature elephants living on the island. Actually, the, the elephants are extinct now, but they're, they're tiny little elephants. So how did this island get tiny little elephants? Well, what happened is some elephants got to the island, and the island, due to whatever geologic processes or whatever, became detached from the mainland. So the elephants are stuck on this island, and the weather changes, so food starts to get scarce on the island, and you have an advantage if you're smaller, if there's less food around, right? Because you don't have to eat as much. So the big ones start dying out, and the smaller ones are favored. And, and so very slowly, if, if, if very slowly the food on an island starts to disappear, then the organisms will get smaller. And that's seen in a lot of different uh, species. As a matter of fact, their uh, population of dwarf humans was recently found on the Indonesian islands. They're called Homo floresiensis. We'll, we'll talk about it uh, after the AP exam. And they're little tiny humans because the same thing happened. They were stuck on an island where food got scarce. And then finally food got so scarce that they went extinct. 
the Homo floresiensis and the little dwarf elephants. But they evolved to be smaller until that. And so the same thing could happen with giraffes. So they're not they're all extinct. There's only one species of Homo. Too much. I don't know. Yeah, you really want to say Milo is an elephant? No, different island. Yeah, there's only one Homo species left. That's Homo sapiens. Yes. Is it possible for an organism to outgrow the environment and that's how they become extinct? You mean to use all up all their resources? No, like like evolution, like if they evolve like you said evolve and to adapt to the environment. Mm -hmm. Like if they evolve so that they outgrew the environment. What do you mean outgrow? Like the cold. giraffes are too tall? Yeah, I guess. Well, well, you're not going to have giraffes that get too tall because they'll die out too because maybe they're too tall to, to get water or too tall or maybe they're hunted easier or they can't support their body or they have to eat too much because they're so tall. So nature has, nature has two ways. You've got to be tall to reach food, but you can't be too tall. So if you're too tall, you die out, and if you're too short, you die out. You've got to be just right. And so there's constantly this this thing that nature is doing, selecting the just right individuals. Goldilocks. Yeah. Here's some things uh, Darwin saw. He saw glyptodonts, which are giant armadillo looking species, and he said that looks like a, a lot like an armadillo, but these were fossils that he saw. He, he didn't see the actual animal, he, he saw the fossils. And so in areas where he'd see glyptodont fossils, and glyptodonts are huge, they're like this big. The fossil, he saw these fossils. And in those in areas where he saw these huge fossils, there were armadillos running around everywhere. And he said perhaps the glyptodont evolved over time to be smaller and is now an armadillo. That's getting the idea of natural selection in his head, that it changed over time. Remember, the thinking at the time was nothing changes. Everything stays the same. But here he's seeing fossils of this and then armadillos running around. And, and, and if, you look through the, if you look through the fossil record, Darwin's right. These huge glyptodont fossils get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. How tall is one? Like a, like a, a glyptodont? It's about that big. It's huge. I have a picture of myself in a museum standing next to one. This is a uh, Mylodon, uh, which is a giant, about 10 foot tall um, sloth. And the Mylodon has changed over time into the modern day sloth. 10 foot? That's disgusting. Like, I would, like, run through it. Hold on, let me show you. Uh, it's 10 feet, so I think it would win. I don't know, bears are pretty big. Uh, sloths are, are pretty strong. I think it's bears are too. They're strong, dude. Sloths? Oh, yeah, they're strong. They're just really slow. They're pulling themselves up? Yeah, they're not ferocious. Yeah. Experiencing a sloth <laughs> my mom is running and she's just like, oh no. Oh no, look out. Catch me next to a, uh, a Mylodon fossil. Oh, look at that. Um, that's a Mylodon or a Glyptodon? I'm a Glyptodon, thank you. A Glyptodon fossil. So which means museum was that? What's that? Which museum was that? It's in uh, the, the University of Nebraska. Could it, like, what, it, like, what did it eat? Uh, it's an herbivore. It ate plants. And there's the Mylodon, and that's what it is nowadays. It changed from huge to smaller. So you can go from small to big, you can go from big to small. There's a lot of ways to evolve, and it just depends on what nature is selecting as the right individual for the area.
There's me and my dad on the same trip. <laughs> Why am I showing that? Because we went to the Painted Desert in Arizona, and you can see the layers of rock there. <laughs> the layers of rock. We know now that those layers are deposited over time. And the further down you go in the rock layers, the older the organisms that you find buried in those rocks are. <coughs> so if you find uh, glyptodonts way down here, and modern armadillos up here, you should find in between them medium-sized, right? The glyptodont evolved into the armadillo, and you find glyptodonts real old, and armadillos now, then in between, shouldn't you have a progression of this giant glyptodont getting smaller maybe over time? Wasn't that what you expect? That's exactly what they find. So if this is true about the giraffe's neck getting longer and longer, wouldn't you expect to find giraffe fossils with medium-sized necks in the, in the rock layers in between nowadays and a long time ago? That's exactly what they find. This is proof of evolution. If they didn't find anything like that, they call them transition fossils, if there weren't any, that would be evidence against evolution. That would be evidence for creation or something like that, where all of a sudden there are these organisms that are different. But you never find that. You always find transition fossils. So there is a crocodile. What's that? Crocodile. Crocodile. Do you remember that? Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, dinosaurs changing to birds, you mean? Well, in reference to something else, you should explain. No, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> So, anyway, yeah, we gone. went around and saw these areas where they find fossils. Yeah, that was my sister, not an older sister. Sarah? Pretty popular name. Oh, so she go fossils. What's that? She go fossil hunting. Anything yeah, fossil, fossil hunting, uh... I want to be an archaeologist for a long time. Me too. You can do that. Around here, you think? <laughs> Around here, or we have to go yeah, there are fossils around here. Um, this area where we are used to be underwater. So you'll find fossil fish and stuff in the land around here. As a matter of fact, the largest fossilized whale skeleton was found in Macon. What? You know what that means, don't you? you tell me. Macon was once underwater. That's right. Oh. That's where they buried Moby Dick. Um, Darwin, another, another thing that Darwin uh, discussed was, the, uh, was what he called biogeography. In a grassland in England, you'd see rabbits. In a grassland in South America, you'd see these. They're called Patagonian hares. And they have similar characteristics as rabbits. But clearly the face looks different. Well, these Patagonian hares evolved from these guys. You know what these guys are? Capybaras. Nailed it. Capybaras. These capybaras are nearby, you see. And so Darwin sees these capybaras nearby. In the grasslands, he sees these Patagonian hares. Yeah, these are these are still alive. And the Patagonian hare's body form matches the rabbit's body form. They, they both have the, the big ears. They both run around. They dive in holes. Um, they're, they're both the same size. They're about the size of rabbits. So, so Darwin says, how, how come it's not a rabbit in the grassland in South America? It's because... It's because these things, there weren't any rabbits around there. These things evolved from the capybaras that are, near, that are around the area and nearby. The world's largest rodent. Capybara, yeah. It looks like a groundhog. Here's another thing that you see that Darwin saw. Um, on the Galapagos Islands, there are giant tortoises 
And they run around, there's, a, there's, there's 13, 14 different islands of the Galapagos, and there's tortoises, there used to be tortoises on almost every island because of humans uh, hunting and such. Uh, many, they're extinct on most of the islands now. But on one of the islands, the tortoises have these real long necks, just like giraffes almost. And on all the other islands, the necks aren't so long. Well, on the one island where the tortoise lives with the long necks, there's no food on the ground. It's barren. I walked on the island. I saw it. There's not. The only food are these cactuses. And these cactuses, uh, you can, uh, the, they, they grow these young pads that don't have spines. And the giant tortoises will eat the little pads of the cactuses that don't have spines, you see. And so that was the only food. Now, if you look at the cactuses that are on those islands where the giant tortoises live with the long necks, those cactuses are real tall. So these tortoises evolved these long necks, and at the same time, the cactuses evolved to be real tall. We call that coevolution. They're both evolving to try and escape one another, you see. One's trying to eat, and one's trying to escape being eaten. And on no other island do you find tortoises with long necks, and on no other island do you find these huge cactuses. I took that picture. That's a long neck tortoise. Aren't they weird looking? So why'd they get so big on a small island? They're, they had nothing hunting them. Uh -huh. There was nothing that ate them there, and so they just kept getting bigger and bigger. How tall are they? Can anything eat turtles at all? That's, you know, it gives you an idea of how big they are. This was? Yeah? Do turtles or tortoise, tortoises, do they have any predators? Cause um, they yeah, they can just coil up in their yeah. shell. Um, where they get eaten is when they're babies. Yeah. Like um, birds and stuff will yeah. snatch the, the babies. So the eagle will pick up the turtle and drop it from 100 feet and smash the shell and eat the turtle. Have you seen that before? Are there any other kind of shot about There are the iguanas. They're, yeah, they're penguins. penguins. Did they ever try to bite you? Look, they had this shell. Now nah, they don't. They don't mess with people. There's hawks and there's a lot of birds. Are this penguins? This is a shell that was just laying around in a bar I was at, so I got in there. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> that shell's real heavy, by the way. I could barely hold it up. <laughs> Look at that. That's the cactus. This is the this is the island where the long neck turtles were. They can reach that? That? <laughs> it can't reach this one. This one's this one's able to grow tall enough for the, the tortoises can't reach it. Well, I don't know, maybe this because it's the, the tree adapted to have no way to climb it. I'm guessing the, that those tortoises, the long neck tortoises, are going to die or die out because of those That's really so tall ones. Uh, well, there's there's always smaller ones, too. Yeah, there's but I mean, if they the keep trees, dying, if the, tor if the, the tortoises top. keep eating the small ones, eventually the small yeah, ones are going right. to disappear. Well, the, t the tortoises are no longer there on this island. They all went extinct. And they uh, the only long neck ones are on another island where they moved them there to try and save the population. Yeah, that was George. He's the last one. Yep, lonesome George. You did? Yeah, he died recently. Look, I can't reach the cactuses. I'm too short. If I were taller, I'd survive. Yeah, those are the little pads. They, those don't have spikes on them. Can you live in? Now, now I'm on an island where there weren't long neck tortoises, and this is the same cactus. And see how much shorter it is? Were they telling you this, or were you just knowing this? They were, they were telling me this. <laughs> they were telling me this, but I'd already learned it, so yeah, I did know it. You spoke Spanish? Mm -hmm. um, they, they spoke English. Okay. You wonder about the human population. Is this also happening with humans? Yes. All of the differences in the human population result from evolution that has happened 
within the last 100,000 years. Because the human population started in Africa. And after the AP exam, I'm going to do three days on human evolution. It's they, they don't test on it on the AP exam, so I'm not going to do it during the year here. But it's very interesting stuff. And we'll talk about human evolution after the AP exam. And uh, But we know that humans all came from Africa, a group that evolved in Africa about 100,000 years ago. <coughs> that number is under some um, scrutiny maybe 150,000 years ago, maybe even 200,000 years ago. Anyway, this group of humans spread out into Europe, into Asia, about 13,000 years ago, crossed over uh, at the Bering Strait in Alaska, and then came into the Americas. And basically, all the changes, the reason why hum different races of humans look so different is because of evolution that has happened in the last 200,000 years. People in Africa have real dark skin. People in Europe have real light skin. That was a change, an evolutionary change that happened because when you go up into Europe, there's not as much sunlight. You don't need as much protection from the sun. So if you're born real dark in Europe, you're wasting some of your resources producing this protein called melanin that protects you from sun damage. If you were born lighter skin, you wouldn't be wasting resources making melanin. You'd ha you wouldn't have to eat as much. Lots of vitamin D. I'm white. If I was standing by a black person exactly my size, he'd have to eat more than me because he has to make the dark skin color. So I'd have an advantage in an area that didn't have much sunlight. He'd have an advantage in an area that had a lot of sunlight because I wouldn't have the skin protection and I'd die from skin cancer. And he wouldn't. I'd have the advantage in Europe because I don't have to eat as much as he does. So you see how the changes happen in the human race. Skin color is one thing. There's a lot of other changes. If you look at Eskimos, they're short and squat and kind of thick. It's cold up there. That's the best way to keep warm. If you look at an African Bushman, he's tall and thin and kind of bony. That's the best way to keep cool. And so these changes happen in different areas. Yes? No, no, because if I, if me and my wife have a bunch of kids, there's going to be variation. Some are going to be a little darker skin. Some are going to be a little lighter skin. Some are going to be just like the parents. So if you got ten kids and you're in an area that's real sunny, the darker ones are going to tend to survive better, and the lighter ones are going to tend not to do so well. And then they'll have kids. And the next generation will have kids, and so it is natural selection. Question? Random. Yes? Do black people? They get a lot less of it than white people. So they, can. they can, if they get enough, enough sun. A real dark-skinned black person? Probably never. Like when you go to the Caribbean, they get charcoal. Yeah. Well, we don't have charcoal the records, that's what I say. Now, another thing you'll read about is something that's called, um, it's not uh, natural, it's not uh, natural selection, it's um, artificial selection. Artificial selection is where you, where the human chooses what mates and what characteristics they want. Is that like artificial selection? Uh, no, it's, it's selection in that, for instance, if you want a small dog, you take the smallest dog in the litter and mate him with the smallest dog of that litter. And you mate them and they'll have a bunch of small dogs. And then you pick the smallest one of that litter and mate them. And if you do this for hundreds or thousands of years, you're going to end up with really small dogs, chihuahuas and stuff. Or if you do it the reverse and take big dogs and mate them with big dogs, you end up with big dogs over thousands of years. Clifford. Every species of dog has evolved in the last 9,000 years, mostly due to artificial selection, humans picking what, what they want out of a dog. They all evolved from the wolf. So dog, the, all the species of dogs were kind of made by humans breeding what they wanted. Small dogs are able to get in the holes and chase rats and protect crops. 
big dogs were able to, to guard humans and, and fight for them and such. So we've wanted all sorts of different species. Uh, how long have we been like breeding dogs and stuff? 9,000 years. There, there's evidence and records that for 9,000 years they've been breeding dogs. How long have you been breeding them for like, not just for like hunting and stuff? Yeah, for, any, for anything. Some for <coughs> how well they can smell, tracking and, and hunting and guarding and, uh, you know, guiding. I mean, yeah. you, oh, go ahead. How long have you been keeping them like just as pets? Though? Like not for any purpose. About 9,000 years, they think. Yeah, they were the first domesticated mm -hmm. animals. Yeah, what was your question? You can turn it on.